Christian prayers are predominantly not ritualistic as they may be in some other religions. The purpose of prayer for believers is not to present our wish list to God, but to get in line with his kingdom desires for us. John Stott wrote, The purpose of prayer is emphatically not to bend God's will to ours, but rather to align our will to his. In another book, Stott writes, Prayer is the very way God himself has chosen for us to express our conscious need of him and our humble dependence on him. One way to understand prayer, what to pray for, and how to pray is to study devotionals and other writings. But what can we learn from examining how Jesus himself prayed? What can Jesus teach us about how to properly implement this all-important line of access to God known as prayer in our day-to-day -day lives? Stay tuned till the end. If this is your first time here, make sure and hit that subscribe button and click the bell so that you never miss a video or an interview. Our goal is to help you enter into a confirmed, confident, and eternal relationship with the source of all life and purpose. Many people tend to gravitate to what is identified as the Lord's Prayer when they think about Jesus praying. And although there is much to learn from this oft-repeated prayer, this is more of Jesus teaching his disciples and thereby us how to pray and the sort of things that we should be asking for. Now, much has been written on the Lord's Prayer, so this video will delve more deeply into the life of prayer that Jesus lived and modeled. Of all the miraculous and glorious things that Jesus did in the presence of his disciples, the only thing we have record of the disciples asking Jesus to teach them to do was how to pray. There was no question asked about how to turn water into wine or, or how to start a food pantry by multiplying the fish and loaves of bread. But how do you pray? The disciples understood through watching Jesus that prayer was the key to everything he did. Luke 11.1 1 reads, Now it came to pass as he was praying at a certain place when he ceased that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Prayer would become their avenue to God and a lifeline for their whole lives, as it should be for our lives as well. Now this also reveals one key about prayer. We should learn to talk to God by listening to him first through his word. The disciples heard Jesus praying and therefore knew the words being used and witnessed later the power being expressed. In the history and doctrine of prayer, nothing is more important than the light shed upon the subject by the prayers of Jesus. These are to be studied in connection with his teaching concerning prayer, found in the model of the Lord's Prayer, and general statements and hints to his disciples. We are to not only model the character of Jesus, but the life of Jesus as well. So before we examine some specific prayers of Jesus, here are some general characteristics of his prayer life. Jesus Christ's practice of prayer. He prayed regularly. He often prayed alone. He had prayer at specific times in his life where there was a significant event upcoming. He communed with the Father through prayer. He submitted to the will of the Father and the Godhead through prayer. He gave praise and thanks to his Father as we should through prayer. And we can see that the prayer life of Jesus continued on through his disciples and their teaching about prayer. So let's take a look at some of the prayers of Jesus as well as at Jesus's prayer life in general. Now this will not be an exhaustive list, but it will be helpful. Mark chapter one, verse 35. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. 
Now notice the amount of time Jesus spent in prayer. Notice the solitude, not that we should always be praying alone, but there was no alarm clock. Jesus woke up before the sun. <laughs> we could say that the sun woke up before the sun. But what may be often missed about the ministry work of Jesus and specifically his miracles is that the visible manifestation of him doing the healing, preaching the sermon, challenging the Pharisees, giving sight to the blind, and even going to the cross were the result of his time in prayer. In Dallas Willard's book, The Spirit of the Disciplines, he writes, our mistake is to think that following Jesus consists in loving our enemies, going the second mile, turning the other cheek, suffering patiently and hopefully while living the rest of our lives just as everyone around us does. This is like the aspiring young baseball players mentioned earlier. It's a strategy bound to fail and to make the way of Christ difficult and left untried. In truth, it is not the way of Christ any more than striving to act in a certain manner in the heat of a game is the way of the champion athlete. Whatever may have guided us into this false approach, it is simply a mistake. And it will certainly cause us to find Jesus' commands about our actions during specific situations impossibly burdensome, grievous, as the King James Version of the New Testament puts it. Instead of an easy yoke, all we'll experience is frustration. That we so devoutly believe in the power of effort at the moment of action alone to accomplish what we want and completely ignore the need for character change in our lives as a whole. The general human failing is to want what is right and important, but at the same time, not to commit to the kind of life that will produce the action we know to be right and the condition we want to enjoy. This is the feature of human character that explains why the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We intend what is right, but we avoid the life that would make it reality. But prayer is where we can get direction for the day. And a prayer life is the kind of life that will produce the action we know to be right and the condition we want to enjoy. The Holy Spirit is able to help us orchestrate the things that we should and should not give our time to. It's almost as if Jesus downloaded the agenda for the day. But for us, the quality and focus of our day and how our day finishes can be mitigated by beginning our days in prayer. Next, Luke 3, 21, the prayer at Jesus' baptism. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, you are my beloved son and you I am well pleased. Jesus prayed to the father and the father answered, this time in dramatic fashion. David Guzik notes, we notice Luke's repeated emphasis on prayer. Other gospel writers describe this occasion, but only Luke points out that it happened while he prayed. The other interesting thing about this passage is that all three persons of the triune Godhead are openly present at this important moment. It's as if the Trinity was saying to us that this moment is too important to miss. And what's also noteworthy is that aside from the crucifixion of Jesus, the baptism of Jesus of Nazareth is one of the most well attested facts of history. Theologian James Dunn writes that the crucifixion of Jesus and the baptism of Jesus command almost universal assent, and that these facts are cemented in history and that they rank so high on the almost impossible to doubt or deny scale of historical facts. Even critic John Dominic Croson states that it is historically certain that Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan. Luke 6, 28 through 31 is a prayer Jesus prays before he is transfigured. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talk with him who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. One of the most noteworthy and awe-inspiring moments of Jesus' ministry was when Peter, James, and John, three of Jesus' closest disciples, saw him transfigured on top of a mountain. 
The scripture says, as he prayed. And I don't want us to expect to see Moses in the sky when we pray. However, we should have a hopeful and honest expectation that the same God that did that is capable of meeting whatever need you or I may have. Goodzik notes, what started as a mountaintop prayer meeting quickly changed into the shining forth of the glory of Jesus. And as he prayed, Jesus was transformed right before the eyes of the disciples. Before this passage, Jesus issues a strong rebuke to those cities where Jesus had preached and even performed miracles, but where those people did not end up repenting. So in verse 21, it says, Woe to you, Chorazan! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And after this rebuke, Jesus prays, At that time, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight, all things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Then Jesus finishes his prayer with a portion with which many are familiar. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. James Orr writes, This language shows the essence of prayer to be not the mere expression of need and request for what is required, but resort to God. The prayer gives us insight into the deeper experience of the Son with the Father and His perfect submission to the Father's will, with thanksgiving, even for what might seem inexplicable. It thus illustrates the truth that the highest form of prayer is found in the serenity of the soul. We can also note that it is from a proper understanding of the triune God that then leads to the proceeding through life with a yoke that is easy and a burden that is light. A misunderstanding of the Trinity actually leaves us believing in a deficient or even non-existent God. And that is not the recipe for an easy yoke or burden. In Matthew 14, 22 through 23, after Jesus and his disciples finished feeding the 5,000 men plus women and children, Jesus sends the crowd away as well as his disciples. Scripture records, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. A Puritan theologian named John Trapp said it this way, whilst the disciples were periling and while nigh perishing, Christ was praying for them. So he still is for us at the right hand of the majesty on high. For anyone involved in ministry or for everyone involved in life, there are also some great practical lessons that we can draw from the text. First, after you have given yourself to serving God and his people, you need to get away to recover and be rejuvenated by God, not just on a self-care date. God is the one who refills those whom he has called. Second, sometimes you will be absent. Will ministry still proceed rightly with you gone? If not, continue to disciple your leaders so that they can thrive in your absence. Remember, even Jesus left the disciples at a certain point, and he even said that it was better that he go away. Don't believe that you are so necessary that you neglect the only one who is necessary. Guzik writes, Jesus was jealous for time spent alone with his father. In the midst of his great ministry to others, he did not, he could not neglect prayer. In John, where Lazarus is being brought back from the grave, once again, we have Jesus praying and then the miracle. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. 
There's a lesson that we can learn from the boldness with which Jesus prayed. And just so that we don't write this off as some special ability that only Jesus had, the disciples prayed many bold and out loud prayers as well. That being said, we sometimes pray for things in secret because we know that once we pray it out loud, God is on the hook and so are we to an extent. We wanna see the answer to the prayer. But then if God doesn't do it or do it when and how we want it, no one else is really gonna know, right? But if we truly heard God direct us in a certain way, and if the Holy Spirit is leading us to pray and believe that a certain thing will transpire, not boldly saying it out loud, may be, in some circumstances, an act of disbelief. I remember being challenged by this thought and I also remember praying for something and telling everyone in my circle what I heard and what I believed was going to happen. And then when it did happen, we celebrated all the more because my putting it out there made it undeniable that the God of the universe heard my prayer and chose to answer it. Before his execution, Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray with a few of his inner circle disciples, James, Peter, and John. Scripture records, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Virtually everyone, Christian or not, has heard or read about Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Before his execution and arrest, Jesus goes out at night with his trusted cohort of Peter, James, and John to pray. Lesson one, never engage in a task in ministry, especially a large one, unless it has been bathed in prayer. We don't know how long Jesus prayed, but it was at least over an hour. Second, the prayer, even though it is for a difficult situation that you personally must endure, should still be centered on aligning ourselves with God's will and God's kingdom plan instead of our own. This is recorded by the three synoptics and is probably referred to in Hebrews 5, 7. Brief though the prayer is, it exhibits most clearly recognition of God's infinite power, a clear object sought by the prayer and perfect submission to God's will. All the elements of prayer as it can be offered by man are here except the prayer for forgiveness. It is to be noted that the prayer was three times repeated. This is not to be regarded as inconsistent with our Lord's prohibition of repetition. It was vain repetition which was forbidden. The intensity of the prayer is expressed by its threefold utterance. For example, in the same way that Paul's prayer in regard to the thorn in the flesh was uttered. Literally, up to almost his last breath, Jesus was praying for other people. Jesus prays while on the cross. And that's an example for all of us to follow, as difficult as it is. While on the cross, Jesus prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. In Matthew 27, 46, Mark 15, 34, Christ uses the prayer of Psalm 22 and 1. In the moment of complete desolation, the sufferer claimed his unbroken relationship with God. This is the victory of the atoning sacrifice. Luke 23, 34 records the prayer of intercession for those who crucified him. In verse 46 is the calm committal of his spirit to the Father. Prayer 
here again assumes its highest form in the expression of recognition and trust. Thus, the three prayers on the cross not only reveal the intimate relation of our Lord to the Father, but they also illustrate prayer such as man may offer. They represent supplication, intercession, communion. Prayer thus expresses our relation to God, to others, to ourselves, our trust, our love, our need. In all things, he was made like unto his brethren, except without sin. His prayers on the cross illustrate his high priestly office. It rises at that intense crisis to its supreme manifestation and activity. All of the words of Jesus on the cross were intentional and meaningful. For example, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit was not a cliche phrase. The words of verse 46, Jesus is expired, breathed out his life can be seen to echo Genesis 2, 7. There it is said that God breathed into Adam the breath of life and he became a living soul. The one God breathed into the breath of life, Adam, the other breathed out the breath of life, Jesus. The latter paid the consequences for the sin of the former in order to inaugurate a new creation. And finally, we come to John 17. Now, John 17 records what is to consider the high priestly prayer. The prayer has three sections. First, in what we know as verses one through five, Jesus prays for himself and his purpose. Second, in what we know as verses six through 19, Jesus prays for his disciples. And finally, in what we know as verses 20 through 26, Jesus prays for us or for all believers. If you've ever worried or wondered if Jesus or somebody is praying for you, just know Jesus, our Lord himself, prayed for you. The first part of the prayer, John 17, one through five, is an expression of profound communion between the Son and the Father. And the prayer that the Father should glorify the Son, but with the supreme end of the Father's own glory. We too should pray to have a profound communion with the Father. Now, although it will not be to the extent or of the same type as that which Jesus has with the Father, but our desire in prayer is a greater closeness with God. In the second part of the prayer, John 17, six through 19, our Lord prays for his disciples to whom he has revealed himself and his relation to God. He prays that they may be kept by the Father and for their unity. Their separation from the world is declared and our Lord prays that they may be kept from the evil one that is in the world, which is alien from them as it is from him. Likewise, we should pray for those we are discipling. We cannot escape the world or its temptations and sources of suffering, but we can pray that God, like he did with his disciples, will keep us from the evil one as we too seek to advance the kingdom of God. In the third portion of the prayer, Christ's relation to his ultimate followers is referred to. Their unity is sought, not an external unity, but the deep spiritual unity found by the indwelling of Christ in them and God in Christ. You know, it's comforting to know that the night before his execution that Jesus prayed for you and I and the church at large. However, we may miss the significance of Jesus' final prayer for us before the cross. They say dying men are at their most honest, and a dying man's confession, for example, is to be taken seriously. And Jesus could have prayed for anything, but he chose to pray for unity. The kingdom unity that has eluded us for ages, but as Jesus prayed for it, I believe it is possible when we understand the essential tenets of the faith and our collective desire to know God and make him known. There's also a brief apologetic point embedded in this prayer as well. See, John 17 and 20 reads, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Some people of other worldviews have made the claim that the Bible is just man writing what they thought, or those are just the words of Paul or Peter or John, but not Jesus. However, it seems that Jesus, knowing what may come in the future, knew that these accusations may arise. Therefore, he pre-cosigned everything that would be written in what we now call the New Testament, before the New Testament writers ever wrote a word. So thank you, Jesus, for confirming and affirming your word. But let me know what you think when you read the different prayers of Jesus. For example, how has John 17 impacted you in your life? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And until next time, peace.